This is the background to Douglas in 1854 introducing the bill which will eventually shatter the political system, the Kansas-Nebraska bill. Kansas and Nebraska are part of the old Missouri Compromise Territory. Let's look at our map here. This is the map after the bill is passed. Kansas Territory, this sort of, I don't know, pinkish, whatever, what, purplish, I don't know what it is. Um, this is part of the old Missouri Compromise. This is not Arizona, New Mexico, where no one is going to at this point. This is just west of Missouri, Iowa. This is right in the line of westward settlement. In Kansas and Nebraska, since 1820, slavery has been prohibited. That's part of the Missouri Compromise. In that whole vast area, the great middle border, great heartland of American agriculture, no slavery. That's been on the law since 1820. Douglas wants to create territorial governments there. In order to do so, you need an act of Congress. Douglas doesn't think Southerners are going to support a bill through Congress to allow the creation of a uh, of territorial government in at this at one point it's all Kansas gets divide, divided up eventually. Um, Moreover, Douglas is interested in railroad development. Chicago, they're already talking about a transcontinental railroad to go out to San Francisco. It's got to go right through Kansas. Douglas is a big railroad promoter as part of Western development. And, um, you know, he wants territorial government to be set up out there. Um, so Douglas comes in in January 1854 with this bill to establish territorial government for what is originally just called Nebraska. The whole thing is called, it's called the Nebraska Bill. Um, it's a tricky bill, because on the one hand it says that there won't be any determination about slavery there, but the Missouri Compromise is still on the books, which says there can't be slavery there. So it's a little contradictory. Um, Douglas is trying to slip this past the South. But Southerners are not so you know, blind as to not see what's going on, and if they are, they're helped by Seward. Remember, Seward is still in the Senate from um, of New York, a Whig. The Whigs are kind of weak at this point. Seward immediately sees that this is a very divisive measure that, he's, that Douglas is putting forward, and it may help the Whigs. If the Whigs can rally on the principle, defend the Missouri Compromise, that will be to their advantage. Seward is also unlike, you know, there's a bunch of anti-slavery men in Congress by this point, Charles Sumner uh, of Massachusetts, Chase, uh, Seward is one of them, but he's not like them. Seward, how shall I put this? He knows how to have a good time. And the abolitionists are kind of straight-laced types. Seward is a drinker. He, in fact, he hangs around with Southerners most of the time in the, er, 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 when he's not in the floor of the Senate because they know how to have a good time, too. He goes to drinking parties. He knows all these Southern representatives, even though they're on opposite sides. And he ambles up to Senator Dixon, a Whig of Kentucky, and says, you see what Douglas is trying to do here? He's trying to slip this past you Southerners. Why don't you, you can become famous, Dixon, why don't you go up and make a motion to explicitly repeal the Missouri Compromise? That's what's going on here, but he's just afraid to say it. Dixon says, hey, that's a cool idea. Good idea, Seward, nice move. Raises his hand. I move to add to this bill the repeal of the Missouri Compromise. Douglas doesn't want this. Northerners are outraged. But Southerners rally around it. Even Southern Whigs, who ought to have said, oh, we can oppose this whole thing, and no. And so Douglas has to accept it. President Pierce has to accept it. And the bill now becomes, it wasn't introduced this way, it now becomes a bill to explicitly repeal the Missouri Compromise and allow popular sovereignty to operate in that territory. That is opening it to the possibility of the westward expansion of slavery, which had previously been barred from it. On the same day as the bill is finally published, this is now the, it's all one month, January 1854, same day at the end of January that the bill in its new form is published in the official Democratic Party newspaper of Washington, the Washington Union, appears, and we have a little excerpt from this in Janap's book, The Appeal of the Independent Democrats, a, a manifesto, one of the most successful political manifestos in American history, The Appeal of the Independent Democrats, written by Salmon P. Chase of Ohio, Joshua Giddings of Ohio, only a signed by only a handful of members of Congress. 
But it denounces this bill in the most extreme language, a criminal betrayal of precious rights, an atrocious plot to spread slavery into all the territories. The dearest interests of freedom and the Union are in peril, it says, and it calls for Northerners to abandon their existing political allegiances and form a new party in order to oppose the westward expansion of slavery. And throughout the North, the bill arouses tremendous indignation. Um, as I said, you're not talking about desert area of New Mexico. You're talking about an area which many, many Northern families looked to as a place they were going to settle. Very fertile land near the Mississippi, you know, with good transportation being developed across Missouri. Um, this is a place that people really thought directly affected them. Um, and even though Douglas said, no, no, it's popular sovereignty. And by the way, he sometimes said, you know, you're not going to get slavery out there. More free, nor small farmers from the north are going to go in much quicker than big slave planters, and they're going to they're going to keep slavery out. So this will work out. But people, but the notion of betrayal, a betrayal of a previous agreement between North and South, and in 1854, in some states, not all, this new political coalition is created, the Republican Party. This is the origin of the Republican Party, which still exists today in a completely different form, because today it's most, you know, it's center of gravity is in the South. But this is the last time in American history, 1854 to 55, that one major party disappears. The Whig Party will be shattered over this and disappear, and a new major party, the Republican, takes its place. We've had third parties all through American history. This is the last time that a, one of the two major parties goes through this uh, transition. Um, the bill passes the Senate easily because the South has its you know, equality there and there are enough Douglas Democrats in the North to go with them. But in the House, it's very tricky. And without going into a tremendous uh, exercise in arithmetic, even though the Democrats have a very big majority in the House, it only passes in the end by 113 to 100, a very small margin. And of those 100 against, just... 43 are Northern Democrats, 45 are Northern Whigs, and the rest are Free Soilers. In other words, large, this is the new Republican coalition right there. A large chunk of Northern Democrats, a large chunk of Northern Whigs, and the old anti-slavery Free Soil um, uh, group. That's the political basis on which this new Republican Party within two years will rise to be the second major party in the country. Now, the bill is signed by President Pierce. What was it, actually? You know, popular sovereignty sounds good in principle in a way. All right, yeah, it's democratic. Let them vote. But when you start thinking of how to implement it, it becomes very complicated. Who's going to vote? When are they going to vote? The first 10 guys in, they're going to vote? Or does it require some population, 10,000, 20,000? What's the status of slavery before they vote, before there's a legislature? Can slave owners go in there or not? Um, at what point would the decision be made about whether slavery would exist in this territory? Now, eventually, the bill is divided, the, the territory is divided into two, as you see on the map. The, it's a Kansas-Nebraska bill. Missouri slave owners say, all right, that's cool. Kansas is going to be slave. Ne Nebraska is going to be free. That's what the, the bill implicitly says, one for the South, one for the North. But Northerners do not accept that. This is an area that had been set aside for free labor starting in 1820, and they were not willing to accept that Kansas would become a slave state. So here's the irony. One of the purposes of popular sovereignty is to take the issue of slavery out of national politics and put it into local areas. But the result of that, very quickly, we'll see this, is bleeding Kansas, a civil war in Kansas. And that will reverberate back into national politics. So bleeding, even though the issue is put in the territory, the civil war in Kansas becomes a national political issue in 1855, uh, 1856. Making the territory the arena of conflict does not succeed 
in getting the issue out of the national political scene. Well, by the fall of 1854, the impact of the Kansas-Nebraska Act is seen. The Democratic, in the elections, the congressional and state elections of 1854, the fall, the Democratic Party suffers a total disaster in the North. <laughs> Candidates opposed to the Kansas-Nebraska Act sweep the Northern elections in all sorts, as we'll see next time or next week, of different combinations. It's not, the Republican Party is formed slowly. Sometimes they're Republicans, like in Michigan and Wisconsin. Sometimes, as we'll see next time, they run under the banner of nativism, the so-called know-nothing, anti-immigrant party. We'll just hold that to next time. Um, sometimes they just vote as anti-Nebraska candidates, no real political party. But the end result is the huge Democratic majority in Congress is wiped out. Um, large areas of the North, in 1854 shift f away from the Democratic Party and have never gone back since. For example, upstate New York, upstate New York was strongly Democrat until 1854. Today, ever since, and today it is the, you know, the heartland of the Republican Party in, uh, in the state of New York. And there are other rural areas of, of the North which go through that transformation. Congress adjourns in August. Douglas goes back to Illinois. To, Douglas is a very tough guy. You know, he's willing to fight for, for this. Um, Douglas goes back to Illinois. As he says, I traveled, the, my, my, train, my train ride was lit by the light of my burning effigies. I was being burned in effigy so many places you could just traveled by that light all the way to Chicago. When he gets to Chicago, he holds a public meeting to defend the Kansas-Nebraska Act in a big hall. And Chicago's a pretty anti-slavery place. This is a Saturday night, and Douglas gets up, and the crowd is shouting and yelling, and for two or three hours, he cannot give his speech. And finally, he says, all right, it is now midnight. It's now Sunday, it's now midnight. I am going to church and you can all go to hell. <laughs> so, stalks, and he stalks off the stage. So what has happened here as of 1854? The seeds have been planted for a new political alignment in the country. For the first time, an alignment of parties along sectional lines, north-south lines, not East-West, not Democrat, Whig, whatever. The Republican Party in the North and the solid Democratic South. It doesn't happen overnight. This is, the seeds are planted. There's still a middle ground. There's still the Upper South and what they call the Lower North, places like New Jersey, Pennsylvania, which are much more moderate and do not want to separate that way. But the, the die has been cast, in a sense, and Douglas and his presidential ambitions will be crushed out between the, you know, with the rise of sectional politics. Um, in other words, what Douglas proves is, in the 1850s, a career in defense of the Union is no longer possible. It had been possible in the 1820s, the 1830s, the 1840s. Now the new politicians who are going to rise to prominence in the 1850s um, whether it's Jefferson Davis from Mississippi or Abraham Lincoln from Illinois or many others, the new politicians will be defined by their position on slavery, not on anything else. And that will be a very dangerous situation for uh, American politics and the American Union. But it is not just a straight line from there to civil war. As I've always said, the history doesn't go in a straight line. Next time we will look at something which doesn't seem to fit at all, the rise of nativism, anti-immigrant sentiment, and how that roils politics in the mid-1850s. Um,